Good morning. I'm glad that you could join in today and I hope you've had a good week. I hope you've kept cool. And if you did, I know you had to be on the inside quite a bit because it was so hot. Our lesson today is session eight in our quarterly and the title is Pleasing God. The scriptures will come from Proverbs chapters 15 and 16 if you follow along in your Bible. A lot of the scriptures in Proverbs may have been older sayings that were passed from generation to generation. And Solomon collected some, but he also added to them. And then those sayings were recorded and combined to form the chapters and ultimately the entire book that we study. And although many of the scriptures are written linearly, they don't show a whole lot of evidence that they were grouped according to a consolidated theme but they do all give some persuasive approaches for walking in the Lord's wisdom. And the scriptures for today's lesson follow that one verse format, but they've been grouped somewhat with unifying topics. And for that reason, if you're following in your Bible, it means that there's going to be some jumping around and circling back and forth to group together the scriptures that have similar ideas. The topics addressed will be a demonstration of wisdom, the accountability that has been established, the importance of appropriate motives, and the insurance, assurance of blessings. So now, having said all that, the first topic is wisdom demonstrated, which will cover only two verses. First is in chapter uh, 15, verse 33, and then we're going to chapter 16, verse 8. So you might want to find that and hold your finger at that place. Chapter 15, verse 33 says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. And then we go to chapter 16, verse 8, and it says, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Proverbs has given us a lot of instruction on just what godly wisdom is. And it's given us a lot of guidance on how to be wise. But these two verses will show us how we know if we're truly wise in the Lord. First of all, being wise causes us to fear the Lord, not being afraid, but of coming to him in humility because we recognize that God has the power and authority and really we're powerless and helpless without his mercy and grace. This fear or all that we have or respect, however you want to say it, of the Lord is not just an entry point into wisdom, but it's the way to live in wisdom. We don't just all of a sudden get in because of that, but we keep keep in, in line with it because of, uh, of how we live. Sometimes we forget that our successes or our accomplishments are not just our own doing. We may work and we should work. We're supposed to do that. God isn't supposed to hand us everything without any effort on our part. So we may work to achieve success or attain valuables, but we accomplish these only because God gives us the needed ability and the resources to do it. And when we're recognizing our helplessness, that causes us to seek to please him more and he in turn becomes an ever presence in our lives. Fearing the Lord, respecting the Lord, honoring the Lord is characteristic of people who live with an awareness of God's nearness and holiness and they're humble because of this consciousness. Solomon taught that dependence on God for our efforts and accomplishments builds godly character and godly character yields respect of one's community and that kind of honor to Solomon and to us is should be more valuable than material wealth. When most folks think of being prosperous, uh, they think of having a, a lot of money or a portfolio or some valuable items, but that kind of wealth doesn't necessarily make a person uh, give them the contentment that makes us have peaceful lives, especially if they've gathered this wealth through acts of unfairness. It says great revenues without right. 
verse 8 in chapter 16 definitely does not condemn wealth, but it does declare that in God's eyes, it's better for a person to be poor and be righteous than to have a great income without God. People who have a materialistic mindset confuse religious piety with um, material terms. They might think that they give a lot. Their offering justifies the means of accomplishing their wealth. And the scriptures tell us that God desires obedience over material offerings and that religious rituals cannot substitute for having a right, a right relationship with God. Now, our next scriptures will address the accountability that has been established. So we need to go to chapter 16, and we'll read verse 1, then we'll read 4 and 5, and then verse 9. So I'll try to let you know before I read so you can keep up. Verse 1 says, The preparations of the heart in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And then in 4 and 5, the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And then over in verse 9, a man's heart devises his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. When a person develops a plan, he or she commits time thinking and preparing every step of the way. A plan might begin in your mind, but then it moves to your heart, and there it may even become a passion of the heart. And from that, the wheels of motion begin to move to accomplish this plan. Now, verse 1 emphasizes that people might carefully plan and plot and think through a decision or a course of action, but God has a final word in the plans that we make. We can gather up our details, organize our ideas, make our list. Does everybody make a list of things? I do. But then we need to count on God to lead us in the right direction for the right approach. And we have to remember that he gives us direction in keeping with his purposes. A lot of times we have questions, a lot of questions, and no clear answers. And in adverse situations, we might ask, well, why me? And why this? And why at this time? Now, at these times, we have to depend on our faith to lead us to trust that God is a loving God, he's a wise God, and that he is in control, and he continues to work things for good on the behalf of his people. We can't see the end results. Remember the analogy, I've used it uh, in these lessons and in my Sunday school class, if our life is a jigsaw puzzle, now when you put together a jigsaw puzzle, you usually have a picture on the box. And you pick up a piece of the puzzle and you look at the picture on the box and it helps you to decide where that piece goes. Well, in our life, if our life is a picture and it's a jigsaw puzzle, we can't see the picture, but God sees it. He sees the picture that's on the box of our life. We only see the piece of the puzzle that we're concerned with at the moment. God sees the finished puzzle. If we could see the picture, we might know where this piece of our life fits, but we tend to focus on what stresses us at the moment. That's what's important to us right now. But God has a plan for everyone, even a day that the wicked will receive just consequences of their deeds, he says. And he said, people with prideful hearts think they're never wrong. These people that have wicked ways and they have a prideful heart, they think they're never wrong. And they know better than anyone else. And this type of attitude is detestable to the Lord. And he's going to hold accountable those who cling to this kind of arrogance. Punish may not happen instantly, but without repentance. The scripture in verse 5 says, he shall not be unpunished. Every individual is accountable to God for accepting or rejecting his gift of salvation, for accepting or rejecting Jesus as his son that was given for us. Now, we decide the way that we'll go based on what's in our hearts. People who reject him choose a way that seems right to them, and they invest in it, and they plan every detail, and they believe 
that they are in full control. Well, it's good for us to make plans for our future, but if we believe that God has no say in the direction that we choose and the outcome that we face, then we're just fooling ourselves and we're choosing a very foolish path. When we trust God, on the other hand, with our present tense, with what's going on, that little piece of the puzzle that we're holding on to right now and we can't figure out where it fits in our life and why it fits in our life, um, our hearts will turn to what he's planned for us and we'll ask him to take us where he wants us to go. And then God can direct our steps along the way when we allow it. When we choose that path, we grow in wisdom and we begin to recognize that God will bless us and he has joy in blessing us. You know, it might not be a, a great bank account that we have or a lucrative portfolio, but we find the blessings of God are so much more uh, lasting and eternal and so much more important to us. Now, the next group of verses are going to focus on our motives. Solomon emphasized that pleasing God not only involves our right actions, but it also involves right motives. What drives us to do the things that we do? Is it selfish gain or is it public recognition or is it praise? Or do we just have a true love of mankind because we have a solid foundation with God? You know, so now we're going to jump around again. We're going to go to, it's all in chapter 16 now, but it's going to be verse 10, verse 2 first, and then verses 10 and 11. Verse 2 says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord waiteth the spirits. And verses 10 and 11 say, A divine sentence is in the lips of the king. His mouth transgresseth not in judgment. Now remember this training, this was written for Solomon's son that would become the king, but it was also for other young boys who would become leaders in other areas. So, and it also says a just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. We often evaluate our attitudes and our actions by what feels right to us. And we judge by our personal criteria rather than by God's standard. We can deceive ourselves and we can deceive others by believing that we're doing what's right. If it feels right, so it must be right. And we can review our actions and think that we're pleasing God, but he alone gets the final say and he knows what's in our heart. Uh, he examines our hearts and he judges the purity of our reasons for what we're doing. So we need to be sure that we, our actions and our, our motives are God-centered and not self-centered. Even the kings of Solomon's days were to seek God's guidance prior to issuing a verdict. They were supposed to read the law every day so that every decision they made would be, uh, con it would be abiding by God's laws. They made decisions that impacted the entire nation and their decisions needed to be led by God's will and his character. The motive of all their judgments from the king was to benefit the nation and not the king personally. But not only was God concerned with the governing king, he was also concerned with fair commerce standards. Um, some of these other young boys would be leaders in that area. Now, commerce at that time was done by bartering. You didn't go and pay with money. You didn't even go and pay with gold or silver. A, a lot of times it was bartering. But they used scales and balances for the items that were going to be bought or sold. And uh, that was not a scale that you could step on and it would show the weight, but it was a balance. And if they deemed a certain, an item was worthy of a certain amount, they would put weights on one side and it had to balance out. It had to be level, like a balance in, in a science classroom. So uh, dishonest merchants really could replace the honest weights with lighter or heavier weights. They would do whichever worked in their favor if they were dishonest merchants. If they were honest merchants, 
then they would keep the weights that were true weights. And the motive of the merchant was one of, was supposed to be one of fair commerce rather than personal gain, you know, to gather up their gold and silver. And verse 11 just shows how concerned God is with every aspect of our lives when he talks about the commerce. His righteous standards applied to business practices as much as it did to the governing king. Both were examples of God-pleasing actions motivated by a right relationship with God and therefore spilling over into the relationship with other people. Now, the theme for the last group of scriptures is blessings assured. And for this section, we're going to go to verse 3 and then 6 and 7. Verse 3 says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. And then 6 and 7 says, By mercy and truth, iniquity or sin is purged or removed. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. That fear meaning respect and honor of God. When you do that, you're going to get away from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. When we make a commitment to God, we're entrusting every part of our life to him and his guidance. Sometimes we find it a little bit difficult to turn everything over to God. We like to be independent people. From birth, we even begin to teach our children to be independent, to become independent. It's just a natural way for us to feel, you know, but as our faith in God grows, then we can learn to relax and gain enough confidence to let go of ourselves and allow God to take our plans, to shape them in a way that honor him and still work to benefit us. Sometimes the plans that we think about that we spend time and we make, we think they're good for us and they're actually not what's in our best interest. And we might have to get to points in our lives where we have passed that part in our life to look back and be able to say, thank you, Lord, for interfering on my behalf. I've had to say that many times. Thank you, God, for taking care of me when I didn't have enough sense to take care of myself. And when we begin to realize that God has worked things out for us, then we can understand the blessings that he has assured. Another blessing is that our sins are not only forgiven, they are purged or removed. I like to think of them as being thrown into a sea of forgetfulness and God puts no fishing signs all around that, that sea of forgetfulness. We might have to face some consequences of our sinful past, a simple example would be if we had relied on drugs rather than God to get us through a rough time, then we may have some lasting effects from the drugs. Now, that, that's just a simple example. But when God forgives us, he takes the burden of our sins away. And also, when we live our faithful lives out before others, even our enemies, even people that don't like us, can you imagine that there are people that just don't like you for some reason? But we receive the blessings of peace if we're living our lives with God, righteous with God. Our faithful lives, though, can silence even our worst critics. They may be an enemy, but if you're living a faithful life, what can they say? What can they say? Now, none of us are without sin, and we're all accountable to God for our attitudes, our motives, and our actions. Our actions are pretty obvious to us. But sometimes we may not realize that our attitudes and our motives are getting in the way of us receiving all the blessings that God wants to give us. When you love somebody, you want to give them things. You want to give them good things. God loves his children. He wants to give them good things. He wants to bless us. And sometimes we let our attitudes and our motives get in the way of us receiving that. In the book, if you had this book, uh, with this lesson in it, there were there was a list of six things that God hates. They actually come from Proverbs, I think it was chapter six. But well, I'm going to read those six things in case you don't have the book. And I want you to think about each one. And we all need to think about each one of these things that God does not like. And we need to evaluate ourselves, not on our standards, but we need to raise the bar up to God's standards.
And the first one is arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are eager to run to evil, a false witness. And this one might hit a lot of people home, one who stirs up trouble. So we want to evaluate ourselves on each level of this, on each one of these, but on God's standard. I want to thank you for joining in today. Next Sunday, if you're back, we'll be starting a new month. It's hard to believe that next Sunday it will be August. So let's all continue to pray for our county, our state, and our nation. Some big decisions will be made regarding our children in the near future, and we certainly need to keep them in our prayers as well. I pray that you'll all stay safe, help keep each other safe, and have a great weekend ahead.